Thank you everybody for taking time to be here this afternoon. Um, so just to give you a sense of the flow today, we're really grateful you're here. Um, and I'm gonna share a little bit about natural investments, pass it to Tiffany, who will offer kind of a grounding visualization for us. And then we'll hear from the man you all came to see, Ed Whitfield. <laughs> and then after Ed shares his lecture, I'm gonna send you all into breakout rooms so you have the chance to reflect, connect, brainstorm some questions. And then we'll come back to hear about the projects that Ed is supporting like Seed Commons and Downtown Central Rising, and we'll have some time for questions. Does that sound good to folks? I like a little energetic thumbs up. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so to clarify, um, Tiffany and I together work for Data Capital, and we're an anti-capitalist wealth management firm that supports investors in moving resources into community control investments that center racial and economic justice. We're proud to be a part of Natural Investments, which is a decentralized collective of 21 investment advisors who over the past 30 years have been supporting clients in moving money to socially responsible investments and community investments. And Natural Investments has over $90 million in outside investments, including community investments, and has partnered with organizations like Hope Credit Union, Ujima Fund in Boston, Seed Commons, and other racial justice focused investments and investment funds. And so if you're a natural investments client, please ask your advisor how you can participate more deeply in, that, um, in racial justice investing, especially in investments that are building economic power for black and indigenous communities. And so we know that black and native struggles for sovereignty are deeply intertwined. And so as we started this webinar, I wanted to begin with this acknowledgement, um, acknowledging the original inhabitants and stewards of the land that we're on because we know that reparations need to happen for both black and native communities. And so I encourage everybody to take a moment to maybe look out the window or feel the land that you're on and the history of the land that you're on. And maybe name the native people of the land that you're on in the chat or share native led work that you're supporting in the chat. And so just wanted to name that we encourage everyone to throw down and move resources to native power building. And so now I'm passing to Tiffany, who's going to offer us a grounding. Thank you, Kate and Sylvia, and everyone for joining us. Um, yeah, I feel very honored um, to be doing this webinar with Ed and um, and yeah, just bringing him more fully into our larger community. Um, and yeah, so I wanted to start with sort of a grounding opening. And in order to do that, it felt like I wanted to set a little bit of context. So when we launched our firm, I took two different trips to the South, to Africatown and the Mississippi Delta, and then to Memphis. and. Each trip included a dear friend, and I want to bring their names in here, Jessica Norwood and Anasa Troutman. And they took me on a tour of their regions and gave an unsanitized account of the history of that place. Um, in Memphis, I learned that what history told me was a riot, was actually a massacre of Black people who were building economic sovereignty. In Africatown, a rather benign sounding name in Mobile's development was revealed to be an illegal slave trader. So the question is, what does it do to us to hear the truth? I want to invite you to close your eyes and I'll um, ask you at the end to open them up again. But yeah, invite you to close your eyes and imagine a time that you took a stand for something. Was it hard? Was it easy because you were called to do something greater than you'd perhaps imagined? Were you standing up for a person, standing for a cause? Were you participating in a rally or a march? 
Was it that you saw a thing that you could not pretend to unsee and therefore you took decisive action? Perhaps it was that you learned about extractive investments and then decided to partner with an investment firm that sought to help you align your investments and your values. Whatever is coming to mind, I invite you to hold this feeling of taking a stand. What do you feel in your body, in your heart, in your spirit? What can it teach you about decisive action moving forward or the rigor to pursue deeper truths? I just wanna invite you to reopen your eyes. Well, now I get to introduce my new friend, <laughs> Ed Whitfield. Um, oh gosh, y'all, the pandemic has been a horrible time, but Ed Whitfield has been truly the highlight um, of this for me. Um, I wanna start with just like more informal introduction of this person. I grown to care for so deeply after admiring his work from afar for years. Uh, and, and then I'm going to read a little bit of his bio, which you all already received. Um, but it was back in August that Ed reached out to me. He was ultimately trying to reach Kate because they'd done work together through regenerative finance, but Kate was off the grid. And so Ed got me and um, he was calling about the work he was doing with Downtown Crenshaw Rising. And um, yeah, I, I stepped into this invitation to uh, figure out how Cordata Capital could be of support. And actually it was one of the most beautiful invitations for me to step into my leadership as a black woman investment advisor. And so for that, I'm forever grateful. Um, and what was the, like beautiful unexpected reality of it was that I was also really being invited into this beautiful friendship with um, with Ed. And um, over the course of the beginnings of our friendship, we would talk about reconstruction and, and black history and Ed was really moved by these books he was reading and I actually just finished the second one by John Hatch. And so it's sitting here next to me. Um, but this conversation in some ways in this very uh, traumatic time feels like I get to extend to you some of the, um, the, the beauty and, and the pain, but ultimately the foundation upon which we at Cordata Capital operate to do our work. Um, and then the intimacy of this sweet friendship as he um, shares with you some of what he shared with me in these past few months. Um, so Ed's incredible bio, and there's so much more beyond this, um, but Ed is originally from Little Rock, Arkansas, and was a longtime social justice activist before becoming involved in community development, cooperative development, and philanthropy. He now spends most of his time trying to help communities build self-reliant economies to meet their needs, and elevate the quality of life. He was co-founder and co-managing director of the Fund for Democratic Communities, F4DC, and continues to serve on the board of Seed Commons, a community wealth cooperative. Ed spent nine years as board chairman of the Greensboro, North Carolina Redevelopment Commission and was the board chair of Greensboro's Triad Minority Development Corporation before becoming involved with the cooperatives and the work of democratic non-extractive finance. In addition to working part-time as a senior fellow with Seed Commons, he serves as a consultant to community groups on matters of community cooperative economic development and community wealth building, 
as well as working in the arena of organizational diversity, equity, and inclusion improvement. Ed writes, teaches, and lectures on these matters of importance while balancing this work with playing blues and eating barbecue. <laughs> I pass it over to my dear friend, Ed Whitfield. Thank, thank you for that very uh, warm and gracious introduction. Um, you know, while we're talking about where we are, I want to uh, mention the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. Has anyone on the call other than me ever heard of that? The Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek was signed in the early 19th century and it basically led to the following the Indian Removal Act. It led to the removal <coughs> of probably a million Native Americans from uh, land in Mississippi from uh, 15, 11,000 square miles of land here in Mississippi um, to 15,000 square miles of land in what was Indian territory. And it's interesting when you think about removing people from some one place of land to another one, they were basically being evicted from their ancestral land and they were being placed on land that the federal government had already stolen from somebody else. Uh, given that they didn't make any new land in Oklahoma just for, for um, the uh, Choctaws who were mo removed from here. And it's a, such a beautiful name, Dancing Rabbit Creek. I mean, what a creative and beautiful name that represents a very ugly part of, of our history. Um, you know, one of the things <clears throat> that is clear to me is that sometimes, you know, we have a sense of American exceptionalism and as a uh, an acquaintance of mine, Gerald Horn, a historian once wrote, he said, you know, it really is exceptional that a country that was founded in genocide, um, kidnapping, rape, murder, enslavement of folk uh, can pass itself off as a paragon of virtue in the world. He said, that's pretty exceptional. So, um, and I'm, I'm here now in the, uh, in the Mississippi Delta, uh, which is an area where many of the acts that um, we've come to learn about in history, including the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek, moved the people away from the land. And yet I, I, I have to remember that I'm in the United States where uh, at one point, the city of New York had the largest number of enslaved people next to Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and it only ended enslavement in New York in the early part of the 19th, uh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, in the early part of the 19th century um, with having passed a law in the late 18th century that, that led to a gradual emancipation. Uh, at one point, it was estimated that something 40% of the whites in, um, in New York owned enslaved people. So this isn't something that's peculiar to the South. Um, that I want to talk about. Uh, it's part of the American condition. We should all understand it. We should all understand its implications. But I want to ask you, if I was to say that I wanted to talk about efforts to restrict the franchise, claims of voter fraud, disputed elections, political violence, uh, exposed conspiracies about attempts to overthrow things, economic uncertainty, millions of people living without what they need. Would that be a conversation about now or would that be a conversation about something that happened 150 years ago? Um, strikes me <laughs> that that covers both, that that could just as well be a contemporary discussion that we're having as it is a discussion about some events of 150 years ago that we can cover in a discussion on reconstruction, which is why we need to have these discussions that allow us to talk about the past. And again, being here in Mississippi, I have to quote from uh, a Mississippi author who once said, past is never dead. It even 
it isn't even passed. Uh, be careful if you use that quote, um, the Faulkner estate just sued somebody for using it in a movie. So I'm hoping that won't happen to us on this call, but uh, if it did, like, I just hope not. Anyway, so this is about the past. So I wanna start out, given that I think a, a lot of us on this call have connection with, with finance, financial structures, certainly the uh, sponsors of this call are deeply involved in financial advising. So I wanna start out by reading something from a speech by a moderate senator named Henry Clay from Kentucky in, in 1839. This was a speech he gave to the United States Senate in February, I believe, 1839. He says, uh, he's talking about whether or not abolition makes any sense. He says, the total number of slaves in the United States, according to the last enumeration of the population, was a little upward of two millions. Assuming their increase at ratio, which is probably uh, of 5% per annum, then their present number would be three millions. The average value of slaves at this time is stated by person well informed to be as high as $500 each. To be certainly within the mark, let's suppose that it's only $400. The total value then by that estimate of the slave property in the United States is 1,200 millions of dollars. This property is diffused throughout all classes and conditions of society. It is owned by widows and orphans, by the aged and infirm, as well as the sound and vigorous. It is the subject of mortgages, deeds of trust, and family settlements. It has been made the basis of numerous debts contracted upon its faith and is the sole reliance in many instances of creditors within and without the slave states for the payments of debts due to them. And now it is rashly proposed by a single fiat of legislation to annihilate this immense amount of property, to annihilate it without indemnity and without compensation to its owners? Does any considerate man believe it to be possible to effect an object, such an object without convulsion, revolution, and bloodshed? He goes on to say, he said, I know that there's a visionary dogma that holds that Negro slaves cannot be subject of property, I shall not dwell long on this speculative abstraction. That is property, which the law declares to be property. Um, this is to me a fascinating speech because what it does is it places at the center of American financial and economic structures, at least in the year 1839, of the immensity of this property, which was human beings, many of whose descendants continue to populate this country, many of whose descendants lie at the heart of the dialogue about voting irregularities and the treatment of people and all of the things that we mentioned in the earlier part of this discussion. So this was Henry Clay. You gotta understand, Henry Clay wasn't, um, the most rabid racist of his day. Henry Clay was a moderate. Uh, he had called slavery the greatest evil, the darkest spot in the map of the country. Um, he held on to this belief. He ran for president, my understanding, five campaigns with the presidency. He lost all of them, claimed that he'd rather be right than president. Uh, but this was how he saw the economic condition of the country and the position that the enslaved population held within it. So you gotta understand that much of what you have learned about the significance of private property and the respect for property rights and the various constitutional discussions that were taking place during that period of time and since then, were at that time intent on securing the rights to human beings as property because as Henry Clay made it very, very clear, that is property 
which the law declares to be property. Fortunately, some of those laws have been changed. Um, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment certainly made some fairly drastic changes in those laws at the very beginning of the Reconstruction period. But we have to also understand what happened to that because that was not a static situation either. I, I want it to be understood though that, you know, in further understanding of what it is that Henry Clay was thought, first of all, $1.2 billion in $1839, that was a lot of money. I mean, $1.2 billion is almost a lot of money now, but certainly at a time when the $500 payment that was the cost of a, of a single individual slave was something close to what it would cost to build the average house, uh, <laughs> then you have to understand that he was talking about a whole lot of money. In fact, there, there are studies that have shown that the total in property of enslaved people during that time period exceeded the entire balance of any other property in any other form that was connected with American commerce. That included all the railroad stock, all the buildings, all of the factories, et cetera. So that was, that was, that was American property and needs to be understood. The consequences of which are still with us. I wanna make it clear that some of the structures that grew out of that time period, even as he clearly enumerated them, I wanted to share a little bit more about that. There was a book that was written a few years ago by a historian at uh, Cornell University named Edward Baptist. Some of you have, have, may have read it. It's called The Half Has Never Been Told. And again, I'll make the, this list of things worth reading available. But Baptist was interviewed in a, uh, an article that was written in Chicago Sun-Times <laughs> where he made a point that was made very clearly in the book. I just, this is a shorter way of making it. He said in the 1830s, powerful Southern slave owners wanted to import capital into their states so that they could buy more slaves. They came up with this new two-part idea, mortgaging slaves and then turning the mortgages into bonds that could be marketed all over the world. Hey, isn't that clever? You can make bonds out of piecing together mortgages on different pieces of property. And, oh, that was the financial crisis of 2007, eight, wasn't it? Uh, anyhow, they did this before. They did it back in the 1830s. It said, first American planners organized new banks, usually in the new states like Mississippi and Louisiana, drawing upon lists of slaves for collateral. The planters then mortgaged them to the banks uh, that they had created enabling themselves to buy additional slaves to expand cotton production. To provide capital for those loans, the banks sold bonds to investors from people around the globe. London, New York, Amsterdam, Paris, the bond buyers, many of whom lived in countries where, slaveries, where slavery was illegal, didn't own individual slaves, just bonds backed by their value. Hmm. What an interesting way to separate yourself from the evil that you are profiting from. I wonder if that still happens today. Anyhow, as slave-backed mortgages became paper bonds, everybody profited, except obviously enslaved African-Americans whose forced labor repaid the owner's mortgages. But investors owned a piece of slave-earned income Older slave states such as Maryland and Virginia sold slaves to the new cotton states at securitization inflated prices, resulting in a slave asset bubble. Cotton factor firms like the now defunct Lehman Brothers, which was founded in Alabama, became wildly successful. Lehman moved to Wall Street and for all of these firms, every transaction in slave earned money flowing in and out of the US earned Wall Street firms a fee. Uh, you know, my guess is that a lot of times when we think about the evil that was slavery, we think about it in terms of somebody in the South with a bullwhip and a cotton field and don't realize that even as that was happening, there were national and international financial and economic systems that were structured to support that being able to happen that actually contributed to the logic of how that happened that were existed in force. And this thing I'm saying about 
contributing to the logic of how it happened. One of the questions you would raise is if an individual slave would be sold for $500, and that was almost what somebody could buy a house for. And again, houses didn't have air conditioning. They weren't like the ones now. So houses were a, a smaller part of somebody's disposable income. Um, but like, why would somebody brutally mistreat such people? In fact, it has led to some revisionist understandings of the slave system that said like, obviously it's not true that if you had a valuable field hand that you would beat him and brutalize him. This has gotta be some exaggerated understanding of what's going on until you remember this financialization question. Because if indeed the value of your property was determined by the revenue, the cash flow created by your properties being able to pick cotton on the international cotton market, then you take a cap rate that is associated with the total value of the revenue stream and you come up with a value then understand what one slave could do to your total property value. Which is to say the yeah, from the standpoint of you damaging a piece of a valuable piece of property, it made sense for you to, to not mistreat your enslaved property. On the other hand, you know, I keep hearing people talking about the slave body and African American bodies and stuff. And I want to go beyond that. I want to talk about their spirit, their mind, their voice. Because my contention is that an enslaved person who might've been ever so valuable in terms of their ability to pick cotton became a real danger to the value of your total property if indeed through their spirit and with their voice, they raised the question of, hey, they working us too damn hard. We need to slow this stuff down. All of a sudden, one person's voice could actually reduce the value of your property by half if people quit working as hard and the revenue stream that they produced was less, kill him. In other words, the logic of the treatment of enslaved people flows from the financialization of them as producers of a revenue stream. And so consequently, something would otherwise wouldn't make any sense. It's like they, people didn't torture and lynch and burn mules at the stake when the mules misbehave. This is valuable piece of problem. Yeah, but mules never went out and organized the other mules to quit working. <laughs> so you had the same, so you, you had this cognitive dissonance of claims that people weren't human, that people were not fully human, that they were pieces of property, and yet a full recognition of their humanity, their mental capacity, their potential for voice, their capacity to organize that was caught up in the vicious treatment that they received because it's only under those conditions that it would make sense to damage such a valuable piece of property. Whereas the fact that this piece of property could actually engage in activity, which would reduce the revenue stream, consequently changing the value of the entire sum of your property. In a world where someone had taken these mortgages and packages of them together and sold bonds all over the world. So people who never heard the scream, never smelled the stench of folk not allowed to bathe, never had to see any of the people, you know, wrenched from their families, never had to engage in any of that, were just able to make money off of this enslaved system. This was the system that led to the country we live in. So there was a war. Some of you all may have heard of this war. <laughs> there was a war, the Civil War, that led to some pretty profound changes in that system. And so in spite of what uh, Henry Clay argued about, well, of course, <laughs> you wouldn't want to change this property system. That would mess up the whole economy. Um, there was indeed a war. Because some people out of a moral sense, some people out of um, their own religious values, some people for all kinds of reasons, some people because they had been enslaved themselves and they knew that slavery was hell, um, that as Harriet Tubman made it very, very clear. You know, a lot of people talk about the difference between house slaves and field slaves. Harriet Tubman said that for everybody who was enslaved, slavery was hell. And so the idea that some people accuse her of having said, I, you know, I freed a thousand people. I could have freed way more if they had even just known that they were slaves. Harriet Tubman never said that. There's no evidence that she ever said it. What she did say was that slavery was the closest thing she understood to hell. 
And that would have been understood by pretty much everybody who was enslaved. So, uh, and uh, the Harriet Tubman's in this world and the Frederick Douglasses and many other people were among the voices that spread themselves um, throughout the country and found allies and supporters who helped to amplify their voices and led toward a growing abolition movement that so frightened the people in the South that they say, hey, look, we don't even want to be in this anymore if you might be damaging our ability to extend uh, the this, this slave system. And you, know, you have no idea how hurt I was after having spent a childhood talking about Davy Crockett and Sam Houston when I realized what they were actually fighting about at the Alamo, which was the question of whether or not it was okay to extend slavery into Texas because the Mexican government of which Texas was a part had already abolished slavery. And there was a worry that these uh, slave folks who had destroying the ecology, destroying the land from the East Coast, wearing out the soil and moving further and further west to more fertile fields, uh, supplying the raw materials that helped to fuel, the raw materials and part of the capital that helped to fuel and feed the Industrial Revolution, wanted to be able to go freely into Texas and that's what it is that Sam Houston and David Crockett were fighting against. These people are no longer my heroes. Just want to make that clear. Anyway, so the war happened. Um, and at first the war was about saving the union. I mean, Abraham Lincoln actually said in a number of times, he said, if I could save the union without freeing a single slave, I would do it. He said, if I had to free all the slaves in order to save the Union, then that's what I would do. But um, it's clear that, you know, I'm, I want to preserve the Union. He didn't like slavery, but he also thought that, uh, that enslaved Africans were, were inferior, that there was no future um, in this country for their continued presence, that there would be a monumental problem to figure out how to get rid of them uh, once they ended slavery. But they were against the slave system. And then, the Northern Army found itself losing a war. And it's like, whoa, this isn't cool. Uh, now, you can tell that not everybody was dead set on, um, on social equality because the draft riots that took place in New York and some other parts of the country where people did not want to go, they had grown tired of fighting and losing people in a war that it looked like it was going to be really beneficial to Black folks who were not highly respected in this country at that time. But Abraham Lincoln followed the advice of some of his generals who told him that, look, we might lose this war. We need some additional reinforcements to our ability to conduct the war. And so in 1863, a document was written which made it very, very clear in the language of the document that for military necessity, that all those who were held enslaved uh, in areas in rebellion should be made free. Now, what's interesting about that is the, the Emancipation Proclamation basically um, uh, set up a system of freeing all the people that the United States government was not actually in a position to free because, because it didn't have jurisdiction over the areas that were, in, that were in rebellion. And all the areas that it did have the ability to free the slave, didn't, it, the Emancipation didn't free the slaves there because these were not areas in rebellion. So slavery remained legal until the 13th Amendment in some of the areas that had not uh, rebelled. Uh, just worth knowing. And, um, but it was clear this was for military necessity. And that order, once the word of it became known, helped to create a general strike, which is to say that the enslaved population found more and more opportunities and possibilities of walking off and leaving the plantations and following the, 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 the uh, troops. Even when the troops, did, the federal uh, Northern troops didn't want them following, uh, and became what was called contraband. And there were these contraband camps and such. But in any case, um, between that and the fact that a number of, uh, of formerly enslaved people and their kith and kin who were uh, free people in the Northern areas joined in the military and helped bolster the tiring and tired Union uh, military forces plus the general strike helped to weaken the forces of the Confederacy. There are these myths around about there were black folk who were fighting for the Confederacy. 
They were enslaved. They were enslaved. They were made to do a lot of stuff they didn't want to do. They didn't want to pick cotton. So you certainly doubt seriously that they wanted to actually um, fight a war to help maintain a system where they had to pick cotton. But anyhow, they were enslaved. There were some who were there. But there was there's no evidence of any wholesale participation of enslaved people on the part of the Confederacy. But the participation of enslaved people, including my uh, my great granddaddy, his name was uh, Coleman Lewis, and he fought from Concordia Parish, Louisiana. He fought in the Union Army, and a pension was paid to um, my my grandmother uh, for his participation in, in the war. So it's always just good to know. Anyhow, um, following the war, the war was victorious. Sherman came and swept a path to the sea and went through, you know, South Carolina and free people and all kind of land was, was taken over uh, and folks run off the land. Um, all kind of interesting experiments were, were, were taking place all the way from, from Davis Bend uh, along the Mississippi River to the Edesto Islands uh, off of the coast of Savannah, Georgia. Um, and a, a meeting was held, this is a very, very important meeting was held in January of 1860. No, I'm sorry. The meeting was held in a, uh, yeah, January of 1865. The newspaper article about it was written in February of 1865. But this is a meeting that is sometimes referred to as the, uh, the colloquy. The, uh, the content of this meeting was instructive then and to this day, because I don't know if anybody else on this call has ever experienced it, but uh, there's a question that always kind of amuses me that gets raised up whenever there's political protest and other things. And it was raised in this context uh, as related to black folks who had been enslaved. And that question is, what do you people want? <laughs> so William Tecumseh Sherman and, um, and um, Stanton, who was the head of the, the War Department, met in Savannah, Georgia in the winter of 1865 with 20 ministers who were taken to represent the black community. And they basically raised this question that I keep hearing over and over again, what do you people want? And so um, there's an article that was written, some, some officer, lower officer, non-com probably, was asked to take notes. He ended up putting notes into the newspaper. So we have a reasonable record of what transpired at that meeting. Um, uh, 20 ministers, many of whom had just been freed by Sherman as he marched through, some of whom had pretty close to that time purchased their, their freedom from, the, uh, from their, their slave owner, including this one guy who bought his freedom and his wife's freedom from his slave master for $1,100. And I'm going, now that's, that's pretty cool because you know, again, eleven hundred dollars a lot of money um, in, in those days, and this dude's ability to find a way to gather up that much money in order to buy his freedom was how precious freedom was to him, his freedom for himself and his family. But he he had become a minister, and he was a spokesman for the group. His name was Garrison Frazier. So they were asked several questions. The first question was, "State what is your understanding." Um, in regard to the acts of the Congress with the Emancipation Proclamation. And they said, basically, we understand the president said that all the areas of rebellion, you know, that the slaves were freed and forever free. And so he went on to, to, to say, well, state how you understand slavery and the freedom that was given by the president's proclamation. And this is a fascinating answer if you're careful with it. The answer was, slavery is receiving by irresistible power the work of, and again, excuse the gendered language, um, but the work of another man and not by his consent. The freedom as I understand it promised by the proclamation is taking us from under the yoke of bondage and placing us where we could reap the fruit of our own labor, take care of ourselves and assist the government in maintaining our freedom. Wow, freedom. Slavery is when somebody else takes away the product of your labor. Freedom is when you have the ability 
to provide for yourself and maintain the product of your own labor. So they weren't asking for gifts and handouts, they were asking for an opportunity to maintain the product of their own labor, which had been systemically taken from them and used to build up the wealth of the country and investors from all over the world. So the next question was, state in what manner you think you can take care of yourselves and how you can best assist the government in maintaining your freedom. The way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor. That is by the labor of the women and the children, the old men, and we can soon maintain ourselves and have something to spare. In other words, we can produce enough for our own sustenance and produce surplus to spare. Um, and to assist the government, the young men should enlist in the service of the government and serve in such a manner as may be wanted. Um, so what an amazing answer in the context of the world that we live in today, 150 years later. Well, the question of being enslaved is somebody else taking from you the value of the product of your labor. Freedom is when you are able to maintain the product of your own labor and that the way to get such a freedom is to have access to the resources that are required to live a productive life. The idea of productive sustainability, which is to say we can produce enough for ourselves. All we need is access to the land on which to produce it. And the fact of the matter is, there a lot of people talk, this is what led to the, the 40 acre uh, suggestion that Sherman made. At that time, there were like 400,000 acres of land that had been confiscated um, in the Sea Islands in that area off of Savannah, Georgia. And the idea was to divide these 400,000 acres of land into, into 40 acre plots and make them available to, 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 uh, to mills. In fact, uh, the Freedmen Bureau ended up, first Sherman put out something called General, his uh, General Order Number 15, and it later got translated into a document for the Freedmen's Bureau, which was Circular Number 13. And it basically said, all confiscated and abandoned land and other confiscated and abandoned property that now or may hereafter come under the control of the Bureau of Refugees, the Freedmen's Bureau, by virtue of the Land Act, uh, shall be set aside for the use of loyal refugees and freedmen and as much as may be necessary assigned to them. To every male citizen, whether refugee or freedman, as, uh, they should be assigned not more than 40 acres of land and the person to whom is assigned shall be protected in its use and enjoyment for the land in terms of three years uh, at an annual rent not to exceed 6%. I don't know if you all knew that, but the 40 acres actually wasn't a gift. It was... Uh, it was a land rental agreement at six percent of the uh, of the appraised value of the land. I mean, but still, that was taken to be an incredible opportunity because, again, people are able with access to land to be productive on that land and produce enough to pay a rent rate of six percent. Uh, yeah, they could do they they could produce that on the land at the at the value of the land, um, but. As you can imagine, and I hope you know, within two years, well, within a year, the next year, that promise to provide land at that rate was reneged on. Um, and so the same person that wrote that general order, Major General O.O. O. Howard, had to go back to the same people the next year and explain to them, it's like, oh yeah, uh, we had intended to let y'all have that 40 acres and stuff, but you know, something happened. And what happened was Andrew Johnson, the president, decided that in his um, vitriolic racist mood that he would rather appease the previous owners and holders of the land who had been in succession um, than to continue to let it be available. Um, <laughs> So there was a committee of people who were supposedly appointed to kind of pass the word and let folks know that they had to get a land back. And instead they developed and wrote a petition to President Johnson that read in part, we the freedmen of Edisto Island, South Carolina have learned from you through Major General O.O. Howard with deep sorrow and painful hearts of possibility that the government restoring these lands to the former owners. Here's where secession was born and nurtured 
they were talking about South Carolina. It's like, here's where the secession started. Um, here's where we have toiled nearly all our lives as slaves and treated like dumb driven cattle. This is our home and we have made these lands what they are. We are the only true and loyal people that have been found in possession of these lands and we have been always ready to strike for liberty and humanity, yea, to fight if we need to, to preserve this glorious union. Shall not we who are freedmen and have always been true to the union have the same rights enjoyed by others? Are not our rights as free people and good citizens in these United States to be considered before those who were found in rebellion against the good and just government? And the answer was no. Um, no, they took the land back. And so then you had essentially a landless people whose aspiration was to have an opportunity to do for themselves, who were put in a position of being dependent on the same people who had enslaved, held them enslaved for hundreds of years sometimes. And so even in spite of the passage of the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, the 13th amendment had the caveat that slavery was abolished was abolished except for, as punishment for crime. And so brand new crimes got created. Now for a period of time, there was a Freedmen's Bureau. There were federal troops that uh, remained in the South. There were efforts to force the state governments once it became clear that the state governments were creating black codes that were going to recreate slavery and everything other than its name. Um, and there was an effort to stop that, which led to the passage of the 14th Amendment as calling for due process of law and the 15th Amendment granting voting rights. But you gotta understand that as voting rights were being granted, some of these folks had a sense that they could no more envision black people voting than given the right to vote to their mules and horses and dogs, cattle. That's what they thought of that. And so in spite of the fact that intelligent people who are known to be intelligent, intelligent enough to complain about how hard they worked, which is why some of them were brutalized and killed, that intelligent people were somehow being reduced to this very lower level. But you gotta understand something else about this, that the drive to do this was not only intended to hold down previously enslaved people, it was also intended to hold down um, the rights of poor propertyless white folks who somehow didn't always get the message and didn't understand and at some points identified with those people that held them enslaved. Uh, I'm sorry, with those people who were benefiting from the slave system. But yet the, the plantation owner, the plantation owner class was not, um, was not at all their friend. I know a lot of you have heard from, you know, about the constitution that the constitution declared black folks to be only three fifths of a, pers of, of, of a person during the slave system. Problem with that is that there was no question being raised in the constitution of what percentage of a person is, an, <laughs> is, a, is a black person or a slave. That wasn't the question. The question was how many white representatives, how many white representatives with property can get sent to the Congress uh, based on the number of slaves that are being held. So I'm, some of y'all can probably tell already, I'm kind of an iconoclast, so I don't necessarily say things this way I've heard it before. And I haven't heard many people say this, but I do want you to understand that the three fifths rule in the constitution was not a measure of the slave. That wasn't what was the question, but it was rather a measure of white Southern politicians ability to represent the interests of the enslaved in the Congress. And the number rather than being three fifths should have been zero. Like how many people, how many white Southern politicians do you get a chance to send to the Congress on the basis of a thousand people or, or a million people? None would have been a better answer than three fifths. So I've never, I, I've never appreciated all the arguments about, they just said we were three fifths of men. Like, no, they said that you can only send one representative for, for, for three fifths of us. And that it should have been zero. It, it should have been zero. That was not the question, but anyhow, I, I digress. I, I do want to get back briefly and, and kind of be wrapping up because we're going to talk about reconstruction was a period in time when these big questions like what do we do with these millions of people 
who have labored and who have been the basis for the economic existence of this country, what do we do with them now that they are no longer held enslaved? And the answer ended up becoming, we'll find all kinds of ways to put them back into a system where the product of their labor is still not long, no longer theirs. And so what arose was a prison system and a whole uh, prison lease system where people were again returned to slavery. What arose also was a sharecropping system where by virtue of the fact that people got a chance to make rules. And this is why the, polit the question of political power was so important because who is it that makes rules? You gotta understand that during this period of time, a number of things took place. Um, you had the Memphis riots in 1866 that um, Tiffany already mentioned in her introduction. You had the Colfax massacre on Easter, uh, Easter Sunday of, of uh, 1873. You had the Vicksburg massacre in December of 1874 that left maybe between 75 and 300 dead people. They weren't that good at counting dead uh, uh, dead black folk in those days. You had the Friars Point massacre, which is um, within a mile or two of, of where I live right now in Clarkson, Mississippi. Um, you had the Utica massacre, you had the Meridian massacre. You had so many massacres in Mississippi connected with election violence that it was called the Mississippi plan, which was used to intimidate um, folks and strip them away from that because the question of political power was a question moving toward creating opportunities to divide confiscated property, to make resources available to communities so that those communities could do for themselves, for which the white politicians raised the question, how am I gonna get them to work for me if they got their own land? That was the question. It was like, no, no, we can't, we can't do that. That was the Mississippi plan was to make sure that the political power did not exist that could lead to the kind of land reform and the redistribution of productive assets that would allow people to work for themselves. And then similarly in, in Eufaula, uh, Alabama, similarly in Wilmington, North Carolina, over the years, all of these cases of election violence. So now uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start wrapping up just because I want us to have a chance to, to have some questions and answers. Um, um, so now we live in, in a situation where some of the same lies that were being told 150 years ago to justify the violence used to hold people in place are again being retold uh, about the danger that somebody is trying to take over. You got to understand that in the Friars Point Massacre in, in 1875, the big lie was black folk were getting ready to get ready to go out and slaughter all the white people. The same that happened in Elaine, Arkansas in, um, in 1919. These black folk who were trying to form a tenants farmers union so they could get a fair price for the, again, for the products of their own labor, for their, their cotton prices within the, the system. The lie that was told while they, they, they're mass and they're getting ready to start, they got a list of all the white people they're gonna kill. It's like, who wanna write down a list of all the people they wanna go kill, just kill them. Anyhow, they got a list of all the folks they're gonna kill. And, and so these lies, and so now we, we heard, what amuses me about that is the capacity of people to continue to believe fantastic lies. And it reminds me of QAnon. It's like, oh, there are people who just make up all kind of outrageous stuff about, I don't know, maybe some death, death laser from outer space that, uh, that we have to watch out for. Or maybe it's Antifa is really trying to pretend like, like they're the ones that want to hang Mike Pence or, 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 or whatever. But it's like, no, people make up lies, people. But the effort of the disfranchisement efforts now as were the disfranchisement efforts of 150 years ago was to prevent the development of the political power that can give strength to these efforts to reallocate productive assets so that people can become producers of the values within their own communities and retain control over, over that which they produce themselves. And because the folk on this call are mainly connected with finance, I wanna keep saying that over and over again because 
I want us to think about how is it that we can handle our work in such a way to handle this dream that so many people had 150 years ago. That what we would really like is the ability to maintain control of the product of our own labor. Now, part of that is still land. You know, and I, I, I live here in the Mississippi Delta where I can look around and see these three and 4,000 acre plantations. I'm right down the road from the Hobson Plantation where in 1944, uh, International Harvester brought out the uh, mechanical cotton picker that displaced so many people that ended up having to go to other parts of the country to try to seek a living because they were no longer needed to pick the cotton that produced the, the revenue stream. But the revenue is still here, the, the large major plantations, now they're growing soybean, corn, and cotton, as opposed to, to principally cotton. You know, the soybean cattle feed and plastics, um, corn, cattle feed, largely beef producers all over the place. Um, but still the dream of having access so we can produce healthy food, have places to live in communities, have places to rent so that all of our, our income from whatever level of endeavor, whatever productive life that we're engaging in, that we don't have to pay all our money out in rent in gentrified communities that end up going and being accumulated in the pockets and still having a financialization of the mortgages, not on our bodies now, but on our, our homes that are being sold through all kinds of structures where we're not benefiting from it. That is what we need the political power to engage in the discussion around how do we restructure a community that serves the needs of its people and helps people elevate the quality of life by retaining some control over the, the, the surplus that they're capable of producing themselves. And that's what I hope it is that we are all able to engage in. Um, and I hope in the course of us talking about some specifics later in the quick Q&A, we can get a chance to talk about that. And um, that's the little I, last thing I wanted to say, and this is the last, for real, last thing. You know, all these Confederate monuments and stuff that got built, it's like, how often do the losers in a war get a chance to build up a bunch of monuments? It's like, that's kind of unusual. My contention is that no, the losers in the war didn't build up monuments. They lost the war in 1865. Then they called for a rematch. You know how, you know, some heavyweight boxer loses a match. I want to rematch. Two groggy, still, you know, these folks groggy headed, they got up and they called for a rematch. And the federal government said, are y'all going to still secede? And they go, no, we're not going to secede this time. And the federal government goes, oh, okay, have at it. <laughs> and so the South won the rematch. They won the rematch. They called it redemption. It was the overthrow of reconstruction. And while you may have heard of 1877 and the Hayes-Tilden Compromise, you know, and think that that is the, the, the key to it, and the key point in it, understand that by the time that it happened, the Mississippi plan had already been in place for years. And the actual federal government had already backed away from any effective engagement in guaranteeing the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And it had left that to it. And had it not been for the Cold War in the 1950s and 60s, when John Foster Dulles had to tell the President of the United States, look, we get embarrassed all over the world because we're trying to get these allies in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And when they come to us, they say, well, look how you're treating your black folk. So we're gonna have to do something different. It was only then that the federal government shifted sides, switched sides to support of a civil rights movement. So this is the world that we live in, but it has shifted sides. We have the ability to do some more things. And plus there are a whole lot more people of goodwill that understand a little bit more about the history and they understand that the past is never dead and it's not even past and recognize the opportunity to use their energies and their resources to try to make a different world. And so hopefully those are the people who are on this call and we can all talk together about some of the various ways that we can do that. I'm done. <laughs> Woo! Beautiful, thank you so much, Ed. Um, a lot to a lot to take in. Um, yeah, feel free to share some reaction hearts or applause. Um, because it's a lot to take in, I think what we are going to do is we're going to send you into breakout rooms. It's gonna... How are people's breakout groups? Good? Bad? <laughs> <laughs> Mostly good, it looks like. Um, sweet. Maybe we can start. James, you want to re-ask the question and we'll have Ed answer. So we get started again. Sure. 
Sure. That, that was a question that um, someone put in the chat box. I thought it was great, but it was a, a question about what did the end of slavery, um, what effect did it have on the financial system and, and what happened afterwards? Like all the mortgages that were backed by that collateral, that kind of stuff. Oh, you know, it's interesting. I don't exactly know what happened to the, to the bonds. My, my guess is that there were some people who might have lost out on some of the, uh, uh, given the bond revenue from that. But what happened was there were new opportunities were created when they basically restructured the same plantations with the same huge land holdings um, in existence, um, now just by different folks. So some of it were people coming down from the north who came down seeking um, financial opportunities um you had some of the the old plant planter class from the south that was able to restructure the uh the finances of the plantation based on the fact that the people who had been uh liberated from enslavement directly had no many of them had few opportunities of places to go and and, and work uh plus the, the, the rise of the, the, the prison industrial system and convict leasing meant that some of the same people were leased back to the same folks who had held them before uh, to work, or they were arrested uh, and, and, and then forced to, to work in the same kind of thing. A lot of the people who were described as carpetbaggers that came into the South from the North were seeking economic opportunity. Some of them participated in progressive things like well, school teachers, I wouldn't call, you know, uh, there were people who came out here to teach school and help with the uplift of communities. But a lot of people just came because they knew that there were these brand new opportunities uh, that existed. Some of the financial institutions, the um, uh, insurance companies, and um, I, I doubt any insurance companies paid any claims to the existing uh, slave owners. Um, and there were probably some banks that were ruined there's a guy named Sven, Sven, he wrote a book called Cotton King. I'll, I'll find the name of it and, and share it with, with, with Tiffany and, um, and Kate that goes into some details about that, as well as the book um, that I mentioned, The Half Has Never Been Told. Um, but again, to understand, you know, that some of the structures came into being, some of them, certainly there were some people who would have lost some money in them. The structures remained in place, and some of the piles of money were not damaged by the war itself, and were then became the basis for people regaining the ownership of these huge land acreages. The South is some place where it's just visibly evident that land reform is necessary, um, but it's not just in the South because again, the the land holdings in other parts of the country that lead to and and um, create opportunities for gentrification are also things that need to be breaking, broken up in terms of creating opportunities for people to maintain the, the product of their own labor. If you work in a factory that's building Tesla automobiles, but you're out near Silicon Valley or, or San Francisco, and you find that a substantial part of your possibly reasonably large check has to go into rent opportunities, then still the product of your labor is being taken up by somebody else. And so gentrification becomes one of the means in which um, people's, uh, the product of folks' labor is sucked into and concentrated. And the other point I had wanted to make is that one of the things that happens with the financialization of these systems as it happened in the United States is that even people who were not directly involved in the early accumulation of that ended up coming to this country and being here in a time where they could engage in what I call it gambling on a table that is loaded down with stolen money. And while you can make a legitimate claim that you yourself didn't steal any of the money that's put on the table and that you are indeed a good gambler and that you brought your own ante to get into the game, but still you are playing at a table loaded down with stolen money and it creates for you opportunities that would not otherwise be there. And those opportunities are historically rooted in the system that piled that money up on that table. And so consequently, there is a need for everybody who has access to that to try to have, to pay attention to the justice claims 
that are associated with how did the money get on the table in the first place. So certainly the, uh, the, the genocide, the, the unfinished, incomplete genocide against the native population, which is a part of it, uh, the entire slave system, which is another part of it, has helped to create this pile of, of, of money on the table The folk are gambling at. And so we who believe in freedom and justice want to put an end to the gambling game and reallocate some of those resources back into communities in such a way as to help people meet their needs and elevate the quality of life. Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll bundle two questions together or questions about downtown Crenshaw rising and what's happening there um, now. And then kind of a connected question from Ari, how do you envision the future of the US economy? Um, okay. I, I, I spoke to Damien last night. I insist, I said, Damien, I'm going to talk to some people tomorrow. I need to know exactly what's going on now. So he, he shared with me what he knows. And um, they're still in a limbo situation created by the fact that, uh, that it's very, very hard to take to get sellers of large pieces of property you know, representing institutions like Deutsche Bank to take seriously a community group, even when that community group has access to some of the resources that come uh, from some justice-minded people involved in, with, 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 with resources. So right now there is still no, there is no signed contract. There's no purpose purchase and sale agreement that's signed yet. Um, the sellers of the property express unwillingness to reopen any negotiation based on the, the late announcement of the access to the resources. But indeed, they may very well, given that they have been through three or four other opportunities to, to make this uh, property available to somebody else other than the community. And the community is held firm. Uh, one of the reasons I love the folks in this community is they're some of the most determined people I ever ran into in my life. They will not give up. So. We can rest assured that even if we hear bad news in the near future about somebody's got the contract, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have the opportunity to the completion risk of this deal uh, is high, given that the community is so determined that they really want to make this their mall. They want to uh, control its its future for the benefit of that community. And I'm looking forward to and, and so they're still in they're still in the fundraising mode. They are really the, they want to to have in hand, so that as new possibilities and with this deal and other uh, associated deals uh, become possible, that they can use this determination that they have to do this in a way that collectively benefits the community rather than enhances individuals within the community or outside of the community. Um, that that they maintain the ability to do that. So they say, you know, keep them in mind still help them accumulate the opportunities that they need to be flexible in this situation and realize that they haven't given up. There's some more political leadership that has been drawn into the fray who are willing to have some uh, open hearings on the question of why is it that you can't give a legitimate uh, community group you know, access to doing this if indeed they have the expertise um, and the finances that would be needed to move forward and be successful. So. You know, we're looking for some good things to happen, but realize that sometimes in between you just have to wait uh, and, and keep digging at it. The question of what the future looks like is just really interesting. Um, you know, on the one hand, we can think about a simpler future. I, I've been reading some things about planned obsolescence and some other kind of economic realities that just lead me to understand how complex the economic situation in the world is right now. You know, much of what happened in the 1930s during the, the uh, what's called Great Depression was that the productive forces had developed to such a point, but the productive relations were at such, um, in, in such disorder that people were able to make stuff that couldn't be sold. And if you can't sell it, you wouldn't expand more making. And the fact of the matter is that the people uh, that most of the product of, of human labor goes not to consumers, but to other producers. The, the bigger part of the product of it is in raw materials for another part of production. And so the final consumer is on the end of it. But if there isn't a final consumer, then the other stuff backs up too. So I sometimes think about a, 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 
a, a more localized economy that makes sense in terms of everybody having enough to eat, a place to stay, an opportunity to make meaning with each other, and the ability to protect and defend what it is that they have produced for themselves. So I wrote an article on what I call liberated zones that describes that in some detail. Um, so in, in, in part, I think about the world in those terms. And another part, I think about the world in terms of autonomous, um, autonomous vehicles, electric autonomous vehicles moving around on the highways and delivering, you know, doing everything from being ambulance drivers to so leave all the people to work with the patient in the back because the ambulance can drive itself and the buses and the cab structures. So maybe it is that we will have some more of that. But if we organize the production of that in such a way that does not honor and give ownership to, the, to that production, to the people themselves who would have benefit from it, then it will just reproduce the same system uh, that has haves and have nots, uh, a few people that benefit, and a lot of people left outside of that system you know, altogether. I've seen these dystopian uh, movies that have you know, people in flying cars on the one hand and other people in slums standing around barrels, you know, um, you know, trading um, bootleg alcohol that they, they make for themselves. We don't want to live in that kind of world. And quite frankly, the world of high tech can move toward that because the gentrification of these communities leading to these elite enclaves on the one hand and mass misery at tent cities and the squatters camps on the other. And we have to avoid that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's the key thing we have to avoid. So sometimes when I hear people talking about, you know, the new economy where um, where people will um, do well by doing good and how you can have these market rates of return on some new high tech tool, then I realize that all of that is consistent within a community that is bifurcated in that way, where some people are living in abject misery. And on, the other, on top of that, you have structured another economy where some handful of folks are doing very, very well with their self-driving electric cars. So um, the future is, the future hopefully will be a future determined by the people themselves, which is to say that nothing of the technology that potentially is available is a necessity. It's not like we land at the end of some conveyor belt with our mouths open and all of the technology that can be created is being dumped down our throats and we have to accept it. People have the capacity to make decisions about what needs to be developed and why. And so if indeed we need to move away from carbon fuels, we should move away from carbon fuels and toward electricity, but not in such a way that produces these have and have not communities where some people are living in the coal mining dump, mining lithium out of the ground, and other people are flying around in, you know, electric hovercrafts. That's not a world that's worth, that, that I would be content to live in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Clark, I know you, you keep, so, do you have something to add? I was just gonna say with regard to DCR, um, we're considering a lawsuit against Douche Bank. Um, it's a 1981, section 1981, which is a pre-civil rights statute that prevents discrimination um, by race in entering into contracts. So I mean, so it's just like right on point. Um, we're thinking about a you know, temporary restraining order um, to prevent um, anything from happening until the lawsuit is settled. And we're considering filing a complaint with the control of the currency. Um, which would bring into jeopardy um, Douche Bank's um, ability to get federal guarantees for its accounts. So there's an active, uh, we'll get your attention. You don't want to deal with us, but let us get your attention. Uh, we've raised more than enough money to purchase this bank. Why are we not being considered? I mean, what, what, what is the issue? Um, and so there are some activists, um, activities being planned. And as a lawyer, of course, I'm extremely excited about it. Thanks, Clark. Clark is um, Clark Arrington is the leader of the Forty Acres in a Mall legal team. That's yeah, team <laughs> and is also a part of Steve Commons. Um, maybe we can look at um, Tiffany asked a question and Samantha seconded it. Um, and it sounded like you were talking a little bit about what are your thoughts on money making money off of money. <laughs> you know, I, I regularly hear that and. Uh, I'm kind of amused by it because in the final analysis, 
The only thing that makes that creates new value is people, N not money. Money doesn't actually create value. We have been told that because it makes people with big piles of money feel good that they're creating value just by virtue of the fact that they have piles of money. So I, I have this thought experiment. Suppose you had this island somewhere where the sultan of this island decides that he's going to just bypass this whole thing of, you know, digging stuff up out of the ground or making something. And he's just going to get this gigantic printing press and he's going to use it to make money. So what he's going to do is just print money. And then he can come to America and buy all kinds of things because he's got money and money can make money. Like, no, no. Value is created by human labor, whether it's the human labor that, that picks up coconuts off a beach or digs uh, lithium out of a dried lake bed or digs uh, iron and, and coal out of the earth and uses it to make steel and the steel to make automobiles or aluminum out of bauxite and use that aluminum to build aircrafts or titanium or whatever. But in the final analysis, it is human labor doing it. We live in a country that has abstracted and removed us from where that labor is actually taking place so that the financialization of these processes allow for people in other parts of the world to be engaged in the labor but it is by virtue of the fact that they produce something there and they don't even want american currency unless there's something that's produced in the united states that they can get for that currency to go to the people there in exchange for it so in the final analysis it is labor um, not money that makes money and we are allowed to ignore that fact and not look at it by th some fairly elaborate means and i think that it, it's um uh, it's important for people to kind of pull back the curtain to try to understand what it is like this whole idea of enabling people as consumers grew out of the 1930s out of the fact that again the productive stuff was was so developed and <laughs> And labor was so underpaid, the people were unable to buy the product of their own labor, which meant that it was sitting around and the folks didn't want to produce anymore, which meant that the raw material stores were not being purchased and you had this bottleneck. And so some folks idea of how to fix that was, well, let's empower more cons consumption. One of the ways you do that is by having um, planned obsolescence. You got to build stuff that goes out of style or, or breaks in a short period of time. So people have to buy it over and over and over again. My thing is like let's let's build a furniture that can last one or two hundred years so we can pass it down to our children. And then because we don't have to make it over again, let's make something new and, and exciting, you know, with the rest of our time and energy. And if we run out of some other things to make, let's make beautiful music and let's make meaning and let's make incredible musical instruments that we can play. Let's make some stuff. If we don't have to have a brand new car that you have to have a new one just because it's a different color than the one that came out last year. And if indeed there are improvements, there are technical improvements and things that make them less harmful to the earth, more beneficial to people, of course we should do that. But let's use our energy and the surplus that we create to deal with some of the challenges of nature, uh, the challenges of aging, the challenges of people having meaning, you know, the challenge of having people have broadly good lives, of, of, of ha good long lives that will live happily. Let's try to engage in that rather than having some notion that, uh, that that money can make money and all we have to do is be smart with our money. No, your money is exploiting somebody from somewhere else. And uh, as Brendan Martin, my friend with Seed Commons once said, he said, you know, a lot of the things we do in investing is like high altitude bombing, where you fly so high above the ground that you don't even see the damage in the communities that you are destroying with the bombs that you drop. Wow, um, it's a really powerful metaphor. And I guess we're gonna end on that because we're a little over, but maybe you folks can come off mute and thank Ed for sharing so much wisdom and history and knowledge with us today. And we'll share the recording with y'all. And um, we're so grateful uh, to get to have this conversation together today. So thank you.